service, we're praying every day, oh God, move the mountain, and the mountain doesn't move, so we stop praying as frequently, and we stop persevering. So it's important to understand that Peter was in prison, and the church said, not only we're going to pray, but we're going to pray with fervency, and we're not going to stop until something changes. Doesn't matter how many nights, doesn't matter how many days, we're going to pray until something breaks. We're going to pray until something moves. There is something powerful about fervent and consistent prayer. If service doesn't go in the right amount of time, if it's too long, my God, we need to learn how to wait and we need to learn how to persevere and lean our shoulders into something and say, I'm going to push through this thing until it moves and until I see something happen on my behalf. It's persistent prayer. I could work that out all night, but I'm, I'm not going to meddle. I'm moving along. Just look at your neighbor and say, be persistent. Verse 6 says, when Herod would have brought him forth the same night Peter was sleeping. Now watch the significance of this. No meaningless, meaningless details on the scripture. He was sleeping between two soldiers. How many? And he was bound with how many chains? And the keepers before the door kept the prison. So there's a minimum of three guards. Two that he was sleeping in between. And you had the keepers of the prison, so there had to be at least one. So there were multiple people watching over Peter. This is important that you understand this. One guard on each side of him, and there's a guard guarding the door, the gate of the prison, the entrance of the prison, probably more than one. Yet this angel comes in, and you'll read this encounter in a moment, slaps Peter on the side, tells him to get up, helps him get his clothes on, and there's no record in the scripture of any one of these people that were watching Peter being wise as to what was taking place. Now, if one of them would have seen something or awakened or said something, I'm sure the Bible would have given us some indication of this. I don't know if they were asleep. I don't know if the angel blinded them and put earplugs in their ears. I don't know what happened that kept them from recognizing that one of their inmates was escaping. But what I do want to tell you is God has a way of moving even though nobody knows he's moving. And sometimes it's frustrating when you tell your family members God's doing something because they can't see it. They're just sleeping. Don't worry about it. When you tell your friends or your foes that this is only a temporary situation, but I'm coming up and I'm coming out and then I'm going right back in to the promise of God. No, you ain't. You broke. You messed up. You sick. You got bills. You got problems. That's all right. You just sleep because right behind your back, whether you see it or not, God is up to something. We don't live by sight. We don't live by feeling. We live by faith that says even though we may not see it and even though we may not know it, God is up to something good. And before the angel slapped Peter on the side and woke him up, Peter was asleep. Which means God can be up to something and working something out when you don't even know it. And some of you have been asleep for sorrow's sake. You've been asleep in your spirit. You've been heavy in your spirit. You've been heavy in your emotions. And I came to tell you that while you've been sleeping, God has been up to something good. He's been moving. He's been entering your situation. He's been preparing you for an exodus. You don't know nothing about it, but if you believe your pastor's telling you the truth, you ought to give him 30 seconds of praise. Even though I'm sleeping, he is still moving. He's moving behind the devil's back and he's moving behind your back. He's moving behind the back of your friends and he's moving behind the back of your adversary. I came to tell you and tell those of you that are watching that even though you might not see it, God is up to something good. Come on and praise him one more time if you believe it. He's up to something. He's up to something good. The angel then smacks Peter on the side, and he says, get up. Everybody shout that. Shout it again. 
Oh, y'all sound good tonight. One more time. Get up. He said, get up. And as he rose up, something powerful happened. The chains fell off. No meaningless details in the scripture. Check the progression. He got up, and then the chains fell. Sometimes we wait for something to break before we move. And God said, if you just move, I'd break it. Well, I can't leave here. Well, I'm tied up with all this and all this trouble around me and this circumstance and this door is closed. Oh, God. If you just get a get up in your spirit and you just start rising up in faith, chains would fall. Sometimes you got to move before the chains break. Sometimes you got to move before God moves. Sometimes you got to make your mind up. I'm coming up and I'm coming out. And then everything that's holding you down and holding you back will loose you and let you go. Wait for the stars to align. Wait for 14 and a half confirmations, seven verbal and the other seven and a half written. I need one from my pastor. I need one from the television and I need one in the mail. And if I could look at a figure in the sky that somehow indicates it, oh, that cloud looks like my answer. Then... I'll believe it's, oh, I saw a rainbow today. That's my confirmation. Praise the Lord. You need 50 things before you start to move. If you read the Bible, usually God didn't start doing stuff until people started doing stuff. Noah would have waited on the rain to build the ark. We wouldn't be here. You got to stop waiting on certain signs and stop obey and start obeying the word. You got to make up your mind is the word enough or am I having to wait on a sign? If I got a word, I don't need chains to break. I'm getting up and they'll break as I move. If I got a word, I don't need to see a door open. Honey, I'm going to put my head down and start running into that thing and believe it's going to move by the time I get there. Sometimes you just got to make up your mind. I'm moving even though I'm limited in my movement. I'm going to be free even though I may not be free. I'm going to be blessed even though I might be bound in poverty. I'm going to begin to make a decision to get up. Some of you are waiting on God to break something, and he's saying, I'll break it once you get it in your mind that you're going to move and get yourself up. Your pastor showed up tonight to put a little get up in your spirit. I'm on your computer tonight to get you to have some get up in your spirit. Whether it's a bondage or an addiction, very rarely have I ever seen God just whoop, Take a desire from somebody. But once you get fed up with it and said, I'm not an alcoholic anymore. I'm not a drug addict anymore. I'm not hooked to bad stuff on the computer anymore. I'm not that man and I'm not that woman. Then all of a sudden you're like, Lord Jesus, you done took that desire away from me. But you got to start with a get up. I'll wait to start tithing until I'm blessed. You're going to be waiting a long time, child. No, you tithe whether you have chains of poverty and you watch God put a covenant protection around you like I was talking about earlier. Well, I got to wait till I have this in order and this in order to obey God. No, you put God first and he'll, he'll take care of the rest. I think the Bible says it like this. Seek the kingdom of God first. Seek his righteousness, and then all these things will be added. Well, you add those things to me, and I'll start seeking. It'll be easy to seek. No, you seek, and then he'll add. Get up, and the chains will break. Somebody shout yes. yes. The angel came in and shined a light in the prison, hit Peter on his side, get up, and his chains fell off from his hand. And this is what I want to work on for the next few minutes. The angel said to him, 
gird yourself, put on your sandals, and put your garment around yourself and follow me. This is very significant. Peter obviously is in prison. And the scripture gives us a very graphic picture of what he was wearing when he was in prison. Y'all ready for this? Nothing. <laughs> Didn't have no shoes on. Had no cloth on. That's why I said gird yourself. Didn't have a coat on. He's laying there in chains, unclothed. Now, if you were, and we'll have a little fun with this, but it's very serious. But if you were to go out to Publix or Winn-Dixie without any clothes on, Oh, Jesus. Not only would you be denied service, but I would have to come make a jail visit. Pastor, some crazy stuff went down yesterday. I went to Publix naked. <laughs> the point I'm trying to make is nobody goes anywhere without getting dressed. I'm glad I'm a man because that process don't take much. <laughs> My wife and I had to go to the mall today to pick something up, and I got out in the car, and she's putting on her makeup, got a nice little glittery shirt on and nice jeans and flats. I come out with a T-shirt that's got a hole in it right here, a pair of shorts I've been wearing for like the last four weeks, Months. <laughs> Dirty tennis shoes. And she's like, are you going to the mall like that? Yeah, I'm a dude, and I've been married for 13 years. I don't care. I've given up. <laughs> this is it. Who, who am I supposed to impress at the mall? Yeah, well, my wife is impressed. I said, my wife is impressed. Oh, God, I said. <laughs> Did someone say my wife is depressed? Did someone say that? Is that what you said? We're going to have a deliverance service for row two tonight. Come in. Give me some oil, ushers. I need some oil. <laughs> I didn't even have my hair combed, but you know the remedy for that? It's called a hat. The girls, they got to get all dressed, but, but still, as little effort as I put forward in my presentation, I still was wearing something. You don't go anywhere unless you're dressed to go. And what you put on often is a reflection, watch this, of where you're about to go. We had our daddy-daughter date the other day here at the church, and it was awesome. And my little girls, I think we left the house at 6, and at 4.15, they were in their gowns with their headdresses on and their makeup on. They were ready to go. They didn't get their dresses on when we got to the dance they got dressed up, and even though it looked a little out of place sitting in the living room watching Dora the Explorer in a dress, they were not dressing for that living room. They were not dressing for where they were in their present. They were dressing for where they were about to go in their future. Some of us, if the angel said to us, get your clothes on, be like, I don't need to get my clothes on. I'm incarcerated. I'm in prison. I don't need sandals. I don't need a garment. I'm not going outside. It's warm in here. It's cold out there. I don't need to get dressed. And in a sense, what the angel was telling Peter is, I want you to get dressed up like you're going somewhere. I want you to start looking not like where you are, but I want you to start looking like where you're about to go. I want you to start talking like you're there instead of here. I want you to start praising me like you're there instead of like you're here. I want you to get a thankful spirit like you're there, not like you're here. 
pity is the garment for here, but the garment of praise is the garment for there. Start talking different. Start acting different. Put some makeup on and some nice pants and act like you're getting ready to transition. Woo! It's a problem. We praise God according to where we are, not according to where we're going. We worship according to where we are, not where we're going. And we speak like where we are instead of where we are going. Moses and his frustration with that rebellious generation of Israelites in the wilderness always addressed them, not by base where they were, but he kept saying there's a land that God is going to give us. It's a land that flows with milk and honey. It's a good place, and it's our place, and God will prosper us there. He was trying to keep a vision ahead of them so they wouldn't become overwhelmed by the opposition of their wilderness, but rather look past where they were and say, we're going to get through this because there's a there, and we're going to serve God like we're there even though we're here. But that rebellious, flesh-filled generation couldn't ever make the transition. They were too busy looking like, acting like, and talking like they were in a wilderness when God was saying, if you just start thinking promise, I'll break you out of the wilderness, and I'll take you into it. Now, we've talked about this before. The journey between Egypt and Canaan was an 11-day journey. You think they were a little bit overdue? I mean, we ain't talking about getting caught in I-4 traffic and being an hour behind. They were 40 years behind. And wasn't the road's fault, and it sure enough wasn't God's fault. Whose fault was it? It was theirs. Because God was trying to say, I'm getting the slave mentality out of you, and I'm getting the wilderness mentality out of you, and I'm going to require you to start acting, thinking, talking, and praising me like you're in Canaan before you get to Canaan. And once you start praising me like you're there, that's when I'll take you there. Once you get up, that's when the chains will break. Once you get dressed, that's when I'll take you in to what I've promised you something about our mentality, right? Something about the way we envision a thing. God has promised you so many great things, but you are in a battle of realities. Am I who I am today and where I am today? Is my present situation define me or will I choose to look beyond all of this and say I may be here, but I'm going to act like somebody clap your hands and praise it. The angel begins to lead him out. And this is in verse 10 if you're, if you're following with me. They passed the first and second ward and came to the iron gate that led to the city. So this would have been the outer gate of the prison, which opened to them of its own accord. And they went out and passed through the street. Now, the way I visualize this, and this ties into what we've been talking about, no man opened that door. It opened for them. But it began to open as they approached it. If we go to Publix or Winn-Dixie or to a public building, an office building, most of those facilities have what's called an automatic door. Motion sensitive. Now, if you sit in your car in the parking lot and go like this, she cut up all up, nothing's gonna happen. But if you approach the door, God, I feel this in my spirit. You don't know exactly what the range is. But one step and all of a sudden, the door opens. I came to tell you, you just don't really know how close you are to getting into the motion sensitive zone. But you're waiting to move until you see the door open. Once it opens, I'm going to run for it, Jesus. I'm going to get it. Yes, I am. And that door isn't going to open 
until you approach it and get to a certain distance from it. And when God sees that you're not basing your motion on the opening of that door and you're still going after it and you're still, it's a matter of time. If you keep plugging away and coming at it, the door is going to open and you're going to have access to what God has called you to have access to. It's why you can't stop progressing. This is why you cannot stop moving. This is why you can never stop being persistent and tenacious in your faith. And you've got to stop waiting on things to open and realize certain things will only move and certain things will only open when you get close enough to them. Keep pursuing. And as Peter was going through all of this, and just let's, let's make this natural for a minute. You're in prison. The two guards next to you, you're in chains. Some angel dude is smacking you upside on the back and telling you, put your clothes on. Chains fall off as soon as you get up, and you're walking out, and doors of the prison are just opening right in front of you. It's no wonder he thought it was a vision. And that's what it said. Peter whilst not, as the New King James, or the King James would say, whether he was sleeping or what he saw was a vision. He didn't know. You know what that's called? That's called supernatural. When God blesses you in such a supernatural, sovereign way, the line between reality and the supernatural becomes blurred. Whew. And you don't know for sure whether you're in the natural or you're in the spirit. Because God is doing such supernatural things, that line between spirit and natural has become so cloudy and so blurred because the supernatural is now overtaking the natural. I don't know if this is real or not. I don't know if this is in the spirit or in the flesh. I don't know. But he didn't know whether he was dreaming or whether it was a vision. He comes to the house. Where that church I told you about at the beginning of the message was praying for him continually. He knocks on the door, and if he was like me, I'd be like, I'm about to freak these people straight out. <laughs> I stuck my head right up there in the people and let them see. I'd have, I would have been, this is going to be awesome. We're going to have to have a healing service for people's high blood pressure tonight. He knocks on the door. And Rhoda comes to the door. Who is it? Peter says, it's me. She recognizes his voice. And instead of opening the door, she gets so excited and so freaked out, she leaves poor Peter standing out there. Now, isn't this interesting? An angel just opened three doors, and he can't get Rhoda to open hers. Like, could you just give me one more? Just one more. Rhoda leaves him standing out there. Poor Peter. I mean, if, if I don't know if he had a complex at that moment. Like, this is really nice. I thought y'all were praying for me. Now he's just going to leave me standing out here. But she runs up and she tells all the people, you won't believe it. Peter's at the door. They said, woman, you've lost your mind. You've gone mad. And there's something to this. Because the question is, do you really believe what you're praying for. Because when you begin to see the signs of it and you still don't believe it's happening, well, I know, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be cautiously optimistic. I'm reserving my joy until I see some other things happen. That's the devil. I'm just trying to help somebody out. That's the devil. Could you really believe what you're praying for? You're just praying because it's what I'm supposed to do and I'm afraid and I don't know what else to do. They didn't even believe that the answer to their prayer arrived. Now, there could be a lot of reasons why, naturally and spiritually, why Rhoda left Peter at that door. I was thinking about this just a few moments ago. Don't you think that the people would have had an easier time believing her if she would have actually opened the door and just brought Peter up in the first place? But sometimes God has to get you to see it for yourself. Sometimes he wants you to take 
somebody's word for it before you actually see it for yourself. Great significance in the fact that they had to make the journey from the house to the door themselves. And all together they opened the door and saw it together. And my last point in this, maybe, is that when a group of people pray together, a group of people will see together. Rhoda could have stole the blessing all for herself and been the first one and the only one to see Peter at that door. But she brought the rest of the group that was praying with her and said, let's open this door together and let's see our miracle together. This is why you shouldn't pray just by yourself. People say, well, I don't need to be a part of a church. I can reach God right where I live. Sure you can. But there's a blessing that happens when you join together with a group of people that have like spirits, like minds, and like faith. And a group of people that pray together are a group of people that will see the answers to their prayers together. You better clap your hands. Come on, clap your hands and give them some praise. For a donation of $20 or more, we would like to thank you by sending you Pastor Jonathan's two-part series, Three Trials to Victory. Just visit our website now and click the Donate Now link. Thank you for your support.